Hello, it's Scott Manley here with a, a rather interesting interpretation of a Soyuz rocket. Uh, the reason I'm using this rather than one of the pre-baked models I, was I worked very hard on a payload and then realised that it was too big for any of the existing Soyuz rockets, so I rolled my own using procedural parts. Main point being that I wanted to have the same number of rocket nozzles on that first stage and of course the beautiful conical stages with their Korolev cross separation, uh, well, feature, technique. Let's be honest, work of art. I mean, that's what Korolev was doing when he designed his Soyuz. He was wanting to create an ephemeral work of art in the sky at booster separation. Well, look, whatever. This is the kind of half-assed model I came up with here. So this is supposed to be the launch vehicle for the Asteroid Intercept mission, the AIM mission by ESA, which is part of the larger AIDA collaboration. That's the Asteroid Impact Deflection Assessment collaboration. It involves at least ESA and NASA and, I guess, by default or whatever, because of the launch vehicle, uh, Roscosmos, the Russian space agency. But here we are getting ready for spade, uh, stage separation or booster separation. So I'm going to point out this uh, is mostly built with stock parts with the exception of those procedural tanks being used for the externals. The engines are, you know, your standard 1.5 meter engines and I'm using the vectoring engines on the core. This is of course not like the real Soyuz. There's one, yeah, I'm using four engines here. Now because the Soyuz launcher has four nozzles does not mean it has four engines. It's one engine with four nozzles. It has a single uh, set of turbo pumps that basically feed all four engines simultaneously. You know the Russians they tended to build multiple smaller combustion chambers and multiple nozzles rather than one giant combustion chamber with one giant nozzle like the American F-1 rocket. Anyway, I should probably stop talking about Soyuz and rockets and everything because we're basically in space and now it's all about the upper stage. This is a spacecraft. I tried to build it. Uh, well, I built it using some procedural wings for the panels and then everything else is more or less stock parts. Would have been nice if I could have found a gold foil texture for those uh, for those panels, but Yell will have to do so. Instead of looking like a gold foil wrapped spacecraft, it looks like a cube of cheese flying over the Earth, or at least flying over Kerbin. Uh, again, people will ask what am I using in terms of visualization overhaul. This is a scatterer plus stock visual enhancements. Anyway, the upper stage engine is just completing its job, circularizing, or circularizing? Circularizing? That's not a word. Circularizing the orbit. So that we will remain here long enough for me to do all the complicated mathematics for bringing us into an encounter with our target. But not before I've taken the moment to enjoy the sights, the sunset. Of the, of the planet Kerbin with that beautiful atmosphere mod. The cities flying by underneath that mysteriously disappear when I actually try to find them because, well, they're really nothing more than textures on the map right now. And sunrise. Well, that's enough ogling the beauty passes. Let's go and plot a course. So the target is an asteroid called Didymos. In this case, I've inserted it into the Kerbin system with more or less the correct orbital elements. It certainly has the eccentricity, inclination, and the semi-major axis correct for a scaled Kerbin, although I think I may have messed up the longitude of the ascending node. Not that that's really going to matter. Just uh, get my escape vector plotted out. We're going to burn out and then encounter it and we are going to be going on a slightly shorter orbit because it is just in front of us at this time and we want to make sure that when we get there that it is, well, well, we may want to make sure that we arrive with it so that we can stalk the asteroid, so we can get up close and examine it and learn all about it and profess our love for it in a very creepy fashion. Yeah, spacecraft are the best stalkers. Oh, just kidding. Anyway... There we go. It seemed that our burn is going to start just as the sun sets. What a beautiful set piece this is. Now, I haven't actually investigated what engine combination they're proposing for this, uh, for the actual mission launch. And the mission is still in the investigation phase, as far as I can understand. 
So uh, it's quite complicated because, as I said, it's going to involve multiple countries and there is a very specific launch window they have to hit if they're going to go to Didymos, and Didymos has some very specific uh, you know, reasons for going there. Anyway, we uh, burn out the main engine just shy of the target velocity, but that's good. The spacecraft has its own onboard propulsion using, in this case, I'm going to be using monopropellant. I'm presuming the real spacecraft will use some sort of hydrazine or something like that. Don't actually know because those details are still being worked out. Sunsets and wow, what a shot that is. And now, where are we going to go? We're going to head out into deep space. So time accelerate away. Let's watch the Earth. Sorry, it's Kerbin. I keep uh, I keep thinking it's the Earth because I was playing Realism Overhaul. I kept overbuilding the spacecraft when I was designing things because I forgot that I only need a few kilometers per second rather than, you know, 15. So now we're back out of the shadow. Time to deploy the various parts of the spacecraft. We have a pair of solar panels, fairly large solar panels, because of course this is going into a highly eccentric orbit and will be going a fair distance from uh, the sun. The the distance it'll uh, the furthest point the power it'll be getting will be something like uh, fifteen percent of what it gets at the Earth. Anyway, having departed for deep space. Well, uh, it turns out that the mission, because the asteroid is so small, I've added the asteroid using the Copernicus mod, incidentally. I'll go into some more detail on this. I guess because it's so small, the game engine, the navigation engine, is just not giving me any close approach information. So I end up bringing up the rendezvous planner from Mech Jeb. And since the maneuver nodes aren't really giving me any feedback, I end up more or less just you know coming out of time warp every now and then, and then pushing the translate buttons until I can make the separation at closest approach, which is in the window in the bottom left. You'll see separation at closest approach. Currently 45,000, 30,000. Now they're 30,000. So I'm just tweaking the orbit ever so slightly, bringing this down closer and closer, and you can see. As I'm doing this, the node is moving around the orbit as it's as we're trying to make the approach happen as close as possible. There, look, we almost got it down to a few hundred kilometers there. 141. Now, once more, let the time run forwards. We reach out, Apple Apps, and it is catching up on us. But soon we will be approaching it and we will be basically trying to get in as close as possible. So this target uh, is about a kilometer across. The real Didymos is eight kilometers, sorry, 800 meters, not eight kilometers. So it's really, really tiny as asteroids go. But as I said, the word, uh, the asteroid has some very specific properties, which makes it really interesting for the AIDA collaboration. Now you can see I've got the closest approach down to about 21 kilometers. I have no idea how big the sphere of influence of this is, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be tiny. Anyway, beyond the whole uh, asteroid encounter mission, uh, it is going to serve, or the AIM mission is going to serve as a technology demonstrator as well. It's going to carry a whole bunch of new tech, which will be potentially useful to other spacecraft in the future. One example is the laser, the optical laser-based communication system. This is if it flies, it will be the first spacecraft to use optical communication for interplanetary missions. The The Lady mission, if you remember, used optical communications from the orbit of the moon, but this will be using it across much further distances. There we go. We've got the asteroid there, and we're just going to back into it uh, and hopefully capture our orbit. One problem is that because we don't have delta v information we don't know how fast we're going relative to the target because the game has a bug where you can't see your velocity relative to a planet if you're outside the sphere of influence and of course if you're inside the sphere of influence then you can't get the velocity out it's just kind of pointless please fix this bug it is very frustrating that i'm having to just guesstimate my way through this i mean come on seriously real asteroid navigators would not have this problem but there is a way that I can actually estimate the velocity once I get in closer. And I'm going to have to get in a whole lot closer. So I slow myself the heck down and push out the time until closest approach to a long way in the future. And then, as we get in close, we can see a second object 
very close to the asteroid Didymus. So it turns out that Didymus has a moon, which is of course why it was named Didymus, because that means twin. Uh, it has a small moon, which is in a pretty regular orbit. Uh, the moon is actually nicknamed Diddy Moon. I'm not sure it actually has a real name beyond that. And the pair of objects are actually relatively close together. I think uh, there's about one or two kilometers, less than two kilometers between the two objects. And given that one is 800 meters across, you know, that's, that's a pretty tight orbit there. So I got my encounter and now it's a case of just slowing down from a blazing 7.9 meters per second, which pushes my eccentricity up to 102. There is Diddy Moon there, flying around uh, Didymos. So Diddy Moon is actually a part, it's an asteroid part from the earliest days of Kerbal Space Program. Turns out that the asteroids in Kerbal Space Program are only class A through E, and there aren't any bigger. I want my F through Z class asteroids, thank you very much. So no, we ended up looking for a an old model of an asteroid, because I knew this existed. I knew it existed somewhere and eventually managed to dig it up on an old download site somewhere. So the model was introduced and it's about, in this case, it's about 150 meters across, which is pretty close to what Diddy Moon is. And now our spacecraft is in orbit around Didymus. It's time to do a whole lot of research because we have about six months before another part of the mission will come a visiting. Now one of the other sort of new-ish experimental features is it's going to carry a pair of CubeSats and a tiny lander. So the CubeSats will allow it to investigate the space, you know, investigate the target from multiple angles. And the lander is called Mascot and it will actually be able to use a ground penetrating radar essentially to help characterize the composition of Didymus before the DART mission gets there in about six months after the arrival. And we will go into the deployment of Mascot and the arrival of DART in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.